Hello and welcome to ECOWAD Africa, brought to you from Lufasi Park in Lagos, Nigeria. A program that talks about the impact of human activities, whether negative or positive, on the environment. Now here's what we have coming up on today's show. In Mozambique, scientists are looking at how insects can help the country recover from civil war. And we'll take a look at the potential of energy crops in Germany and how an environmentalist is campaigning for more trees in Ivory Coast capital. Welcome, I'm Neo Taibi. So let's begin with our top story here in Nigeria. More and more people are moving to large cities and the numbers will increase as climate change progresses. Greenhouse gases like CO2, nitrous oxide and methane create a layer around our planet which prevents the sun's warmth from escaping. As a result, the Earth's temperature increases, causing ice caps and glaciers to melt and sea levels to rise. A real problem and one faced by Lagos, Nigeria's, one of Nigeria's largest cities. But soon a huge project here should protect parts of this metropolis. This giant stone wall on the coast of the Nigerian megacity Lagos serves as a protection against coastal erosion and rising sea levels. It is part of a new yet highly controversial resort area. Built on reclaimed land and sand dug up from the ocean, environmentally speaking, it's a questionable initiative. But project manager David Frame is proud of it. Now these units weigh five tons each and the shape is designed so that they lock together. So they work in unison rather than individual units. And that creates a very formidable defense against the uh, aggressive wave action. When the mega project, which will be called Eco Atlantic City, is complete, it will house about 250,000 people. It's also tipped to become a financial and tourist hotspot. It's a multi-billion dollar project financed by private investors and the Nigerian government. Some are proud of the project and believe Eco-Atlantic City not only marks a new era of architecture in Africa, but will also protect the financial district on the coast of Lagos from incoming waves. Others, however, see things differently. Marine ecologist Ako Amadi says the coastal area is under threat and the project may have contributed to coastal erosion. We make observations, but we don't find the causes of the observations which we're making. So the erosion has become so progressive, nobody has been measuring it in research. And this is a problem that we have here that we should have had a lot of cumulative research to actually show the progression of what is happening. What we are seeing is that every year, the people who live in these areas have had to move backwards. Property has been destroyed and there is actually no solution to it right now. Only the truly wealthy will be able to afford to live in eco-Atlantic City, which makes locals feel marginalized. Sony Alakija is one of them. His family is from a poor district near the coast, not far from the new construction site. There used to be lots of houses around here. A street used to run over there where the water is. The ocean just kept rising and rising. The people who live here can't afford a wall to protect them, so when a major storm hits, the water submerges ever more land. And local residents believe all the construction just down the road has made the situation worse. David Frame says coastal erosion is a serious problem in Nigeria, but denies that his project is making it worse. The entire coastline of Nigeria is undergoing uh, quite serious erosion, and it's something that needs to be addressed. What we're doing in Echo Atlantic in our small part, we are protecting uh, the commercial area and the existing uh, conurbation of Lagos, but we cannot protect the entire Lekki Peninsula. Some experts say the sea level here could rise by one meter, which begs the question, how will Lagos itself rise to the challenge? 
were in Mozambique, where scientists in the nation's Gorongosa National Park start right at the bottom of the food chain. The region is recovering from the civil war in the 1980s. Now, the Harvard professor is studying the insects there and is hoping to provide the vital information to speed up nature's recovery. After all, he argues, insects rule the world. No prey is too small. Here in the Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique, 21-year-old Ricardo Guta is out hunting. But he's not looking for lions or elephants. He's looking to bag insects. This insect belongs to the beetle family, the ground beetle family. If you touch it, it secretes an acidic liquid. Ricardo works with Piotr Nascreki, a Harvard professor. He's here in the park to document the diversity of its insects. What did you find, Ricardo? I found some insects, yeah. Okay. Some in Gorongosa, international scientists work with young locals to find out about Mozambique's rich biological heritage. In recent weeks, Ricardo has caught thousands of insects for the park's team of experts to identify. Three types of insects. Yeah. We have grasshoppers, gafanhotos. Yeah. Okay. The Gorongosa database okay. is still a work in progress. Yeah. It contains information on all the animals and plants found in the park, and that includes insects. They play a key role in the food chain. So another interesting thing about this, this group of grasshoppers, about Pergomorphida, well, first of all, they're always very colorful. After nightfall is when insects come into their own. Professor Nascreki has set up a light trap based on the principle that moonlight influences insect behavior. It is insects who actually run the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they are some of the most important elements of almost any ecosystem, mm -hmm. uh, almost any terrestrial ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, they provide a number of services without which we wouldn't be able to function. So mm -hmm. things like pollination, you know, all these moths, mm -hmm. without them, all the trees and plants without, uh, around us wouldn't be able to produce fruit. Locals used to live mainly from poaching. Now they have regular jobs. A wealthy American donated $40 million to the national park in hopes to boost tourism. Schools and hospitals are under construction and a new research laboratory has also been completed. As we drive deeper into the park, we come across elephant dung. Elephants are returning to the region. The civil war in Mozambique in the 1980s wiped out the local animal populations. Slowly but surely, they're coming back. Even while the Gorongosa Park was shut down and abandoned, the insects never left. Ruins make an ideal habitat for them. But now they're facing another threat. Ricardo Guta takes us to his village. On the way, we pass logging trucks. Most of the timber is destined for China. Ricardo hates to see the widespread destruction of his country's forests. But he knows how expensive electricity is, which is why locals depend on wood fuel. I think we're running the risk of losing our biodiversity. Too much forest is chopped down for wood fuel. Generally speaking, people don't have enough respect for nature.
Back at headquarters, the insect hunters are working tirelessly. Today, they're setting up nets. The researchers want to find out more about the feeding patterns of bats. They make the most progress at night. Jen Guyton, an expert on bats, is using an instrument to identify sounds that human ears can't normally hear. Now she's angry, though. This is five. Oh, no. No, no, that, that was a warning call. The recordings are highly informative. But without, without this device, we couldn't hear nothing. Can you hear anything? Nothing. Gorongosa is the perfect place to study this because we have a high diversity of bat species, a high diversity of insect species, and we're surrounded by areas that suffer from malaria and also where people grow crops. So it's an ideal place to study the interaction between bats and insect species that plague humans. Soon she'll release the bat back into the wild, but first it will have its picture taken. Well, that looks like he's hitting it, isn't it? Well, I mean, he's hitting the laser button. The scientists are counting indigenous species in the park. I like this one. Mm -hmm. like this one. We're told that scientists are only aware of about 10% of existing insect types. In coming years, the researchers in Gorongosa Park will likely discover thousands more, thanks in part to Ricardo and his net. Yes, indeed, the professor is not letting the button drop, and Mozambique can be safe again using the rule of the insect. I'm pretty sure that they would also have to care about bees. They are in acute danger worldwide, especially in the rural monocultures where they hardly find sustenance. In southwest Nigeria, some individuals are working at keeping them alive by all means. But a German amateur beekeeper from the Network Berlin Summit provides urban habitats for bees, so they are doing their bit to bring them back. We humans need bees to survive because one third of our food depends on pollination. But all over the world, bees are dying. Last year, the death rate in Germany reached a shocking 30%. So two Berliners had an idea to protect bees within the city. They founded a project called Berlin Zumt and started installing beehives in public landmarks, such as the Berlin Cathedral. The hives are being used by up to 1.5 million bees. Children are being taught about the amazing insects. So the project is not only about the survival of bees, it's also about raising awareness. We like that. Are you also doing your bit? Tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Now the demand for organic produce is growing at a rapid pace in Germany making it the world's number two organic food market behind the US. Organic food has become so popular that even conventional supermarkets can no longer afford not to offer a wide selection of organic fruits and vegetables. Every delivery is carefully inspected for bruises, mold or transport damage. Organic produce should look just as fresh and perfect as conventionally grown produce. Eating organic is no longer just for tree huggers. It's gone mainstream. Of course, it's much easier for supermarkets to sell ready packaged products than to package them themselves at the store. Lehman Nature delivers to a broad range of clients, from organic stores to discount stores. For the last few years, the company's annual turnover has increased by between 5 and 10 percent. The company would prefer to only sell regional products, but can't afford to lose customers. Potatoes used to have a lot of sprouts. People don't want that. We had enough potatoes to last till the next crop, but they were full of sprouts. Today, you wouldn't be able to sell them. They come from Egypt? 
Amongst others, from Egypt, Morocco, Italy and Spain. The organic market is flourishing, especially in Germany's supermarkets. It began with organic apples and bananas. Today, there's a much broader selection of produce. We're trying to offer more and more products. Take, for example, onions. In the beginning, we only had one type. Now we have two. Same with bell peppers. And we're trying to get more exotic items like kiwis. So we're always increasing our selection. These days, the variety is no longer dictated by the season. And that suits the consumers perfectly. If there's a variety, you don't have to go to a specialty store. I probably wouldn't buy organic products from China. I only buy organic when I can be sure that it really is organic. Chinese organic products are becoming increasingly important, such as Chinese ginger, a popular item. Six years ago, Lehman Nature sold one shipping container a year. Today, it sells 130 containers. You need a very long supply chain to get it, and strict monitoring. Sometimes countries don't follow our regulations to the letter, and that's why we send our buyers to the source two or three times a year, and we have partners we can trust. The greater the distance the produce has to travel, the more difficult it is to monitor. But the demand is there, and that's why you can buy organic bell peppers in winter, but from Israel instead of Spain. So what do rapeseed, sugar beets and corn have in common? They can feed you or put petrol in your car. In Germany, biomass currently accounts for 8% of all energy produced. It means some crops are being used to make fuel. Critics say this is taking away food from those who are starving. But does it really have to be a question of food versus fuel? This unmanned flying device is spying for science. Scientists at the Jülich Research Center use the little remote sensing drone to assist their research on plants. They've been growing new types of energy crops on their test field. The bird's eye view provides the best vantage point for judging which crop will generate the most biomass for making fuel. It's an elegant surveillance method, especially when the weather plays along. It's always fun to watch it and to see the pictures afterwards. But the really exciting thing for us is the data we get from these images. One of the bigger research projects at Jülich is the future of the world's energy supplies. That includes plants that can be turned into biofuel. Which crops are best, which ones grow fastest and most uniformly? These pictures from above are fairly unusual. Outdoors, I generally have the familiar aspect of a normal field, but from above, I get a completely different view of the homogeneity of this crop. Images taken at different wavelengths show the scientists how efficiently the plant's photosynthesis is working, which nutrients they need, and how fast they grow. The challenge is to find a way to grow energy plants without occupying fields that are needed to grow food crops. Species like the North American cup plant could help put an end to the competition between fuel and food. With these plants, we're trying to avoid that conflict, because with these plants, we can go on to marginal soils, poor soils that are not suitable for food production. Here in their greenhouse, the researchers test the growth under laboratory conditions. They can check 500 plants a day in the fully automated facility. The aim is to find varieties with the highest yield and the greatest resistance and breed them as energy crops. An important indicator is root growth. A specially developed CT scanner shows this clearly. Energy plants need strong roots because after the harvest, they have to grow back quickly. 
Ureshur has built up a network of research institutes and universities. The goal is to integrate basic research results into agricultural practice. The scientists believe modern plant research has a huge potential for the future, and they're optimistic about the possibility of replacing fossil fuel with biofuel without making more people go hungry. In the future, there'll be a whole series of plant species that we can use. Energy crops, food crops, we'll have a great diversity of different plants. There isn't going to be just the one plant that can do it all, but we'll have different plants for different applications. In that vision, common grain plants would no longer be used for energy. At most, the waste left over after harvesting food crops could be processed into fuel. Even straw can be used to produce fuel, either as an additive for gasoline or as pure bioethanol. The scientists at Yulish are especially interested in energy crops that grow on poor soils. That way, they can ensure that valuable acreage for food plants won't be sacrificed. Energy from the field. The German government also sees a big future for the concept and is pouring generous funding into research in this area. Now, the West African metropolis of Abidjan is losing ever more trees to urban development. As traffic increases, so exhaust emissions. This week, our eco-hero environmentalist Bryce Delangnu is driving home the importance of green lungs for the city and inspiring its residents to join his tree planting campaign. These volunteers are about to learn a lot about the benefits of fresh air. Brice Delagnon is the activist behind the tree planting campaign. The meeting place is no coincidence. It's the epicenter of exhaust emissions in this city of nearly 5 million. We're amazed that many more people came to participate in the reforestation campaign than we expected. Banco Forest is just outside the Ivorian commercial capital, Abidjan. It's clearly visible from the highway, but many urban residents have never been here before. Brie studied environmental management in Abidjan, then founded his own organization. With this campaign, he wants Abidjan residents to understand that Banco Forest is the city's source of oxygen. C'est une grande métropole. This is a large metropolis. There are so many cars. The ones you see here in the city are usually bad for the environment. They're 10, 15 or even 20 years old, sometimes even older than that. Without Banco Forest, the air in Abidjan would probably be much worse. Recent studies show that people already breathe in 3,000 tons of carbon dioxide here every day. With its abundant vegetation and rare tree species, the forest exudes a kind of magic. Part of it remains untouched and has been designated a national park. But many trees are being cut down outside the protected area. In 2009, this entire space was a rainforest. Today, it's full of residential buildings and factories. There's only one thing to do to save part of the cleared area, plant more trees. Participants plant various kinds of trees, including makore, nyangon, and tiama. The air here is good, it's clean. These volunteers say the air is clean and refreshing, and healthy. The funds for this campaign come from an annual environmental conference. More than 70 new trees have been planted just today. To assess the impact of his efforts, Brice returns to the rainforest. Looking at this natural beauty, I would like every Ivorian to get involved and preserve it and stop cutting down trees. They should be protected. The same goes for the whole environment. Everyone should come to this space so they can learn how to love nature. 
Brice de Lagneau has been able to inspire more than 130 volunteers with his initiative. He's also taken his campaign to neighboring Burkina Faso and Ghana. Well, he is doing his own beat for the environment, but we want to hear about your own efforts at protecting your side of the environment. Get in touch through the website on your screen or any of our social media platforms. It may even be your friend or neighbor that is at this task. Keep us in the loop. That's all for this edition of the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Until the next time, bye-bye.